This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Preseason week one got underway last night, which means it is officially football season and time to talk about some player props. Today, we've got J.J. Zacharyson of Late Round Fantasy on the show to break down his favorite season-long player props for this year. But also, J.J. is going to be joining us throughout this year. It's going to be a fun ride. We'll talk to J.J. in just one second. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here by J.J. Zacharyson, and my old colleague here at Number Fire, moving on now to the Late Round podcast, of course, and also LateRound.com. J.J., it's fun to have you back in the mix. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, I'm doing better than Traylon Burks after uh, last Wolf. night. Apparently, you know, he's, he's just in the doghouse a little bit, playing into that fourth quarter in the first preseason game. Not great. Not great for Burks so far. Um, but yeah, doing great, man. I'm, I'm excited that football's back. So with Burks, I was like playing some DFS last night. I was like, okay, like, you know, he's been, the camp reports have been bad. That means he'll play a lot. And he did. He played 30 snaps. He had one target yeah. across that entire time. Yeah. So like, I thought I was into him because I thought it'd be bad. And then it was worse somehow than my impression was. So yeah. not ideal by any means. Uh, maybe we'll talk about Traylon Burks uh, later on, potentially. We'll see if we can <laughs> snag some player props there. But if you don't know JJ, you can find his uh, his podcast. It's the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. There's a link to that and LateRound.com in the show notes over on NumberFire.com to check out all of that. But of course, JJ, uh, the projection maestro, we're going to talking to him today to get his read on some season-long player props, how to build out pr projections, what goes into that, because I think that the process itself is is helpful to know because it can help you think better about player props as well. And like I said, well, JJ on throughout the season two on Fridays to break down player props for individual weeks. So we'll talk to JJ about the projection building process in just one second. But first, big news, FanDuel has an all-new mobile gaming app, FanDuel Face Off. FanDuel Face Off is where you can compete in quick, fun games against other real people for real cash. It has all sorts of games that you're familiar with, like a home run derby, Wheel of Fortune, puzzle and strategy games with more on the way. Contests are action-packed and last between two to five minutes so you can play wherever and on your schedule. Plus, you can practice for free anytime. Whether it be head-to-head, -head, multiplayer, or larger tournaments, FanDuel Faceoff has something for you. Plus, in most contests, be matched against players of similar skill level, so you're never totally overmatched, even as a beginner. Faceoff is also tied to your FanDuel account and wallet, so you can easily use your daily fantasy funds or sportsbook winnings in the app. Visit FanDuel.com slash Faceoff or download the FanDuel Faceoff app in the Apple App Store today to get in the game. Agent location restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See FanDuel.com slash faceoff dash terms for terms and conditions. So let's talk about some player props for 2022. And JJ, I feel like you got to be feeling good right now before you even talk about any of this stuff because I was reading through your, uh, your late round draft guide uh, for rookies coming out of the draft and that got me on Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, that work, That's working out pretty well. I think you liked Isaiah Likely. I believe I, I don't want to project onto you, but I'm pretty sure you talked about him. Um, he had a good game last night as well. So uh, it seems like things, the vibes got to be pretty good just based off camp reports alone so far. Yeah, look, so far, so good, you know, from a projection standpoint. E evidently, I like guys named Isaiah, although Isaiah Spiller <laughs> didn't look that great in my prospect model. But yeah, you know, so far, so good. If Isaiah Pacheco ends up hitting, uh, I will be a very, very happy man at the end of the day. I will be too, because again, I was, I was on my honeymoon during my rookie drafts. And so I was using your draft guide to like effectively just be my rankings and wound up taking Pacheco in, I think two separate leagues in one with you. So again, you kind of, you played yourself there. So yeah, a little bit. think about that next time around uh, in the dynasty leagues we're in together. Okay. So I want to talk about the projection building process because we've had you on this show to talk season long player process the past couple of years, but Obviously, not everybody has heard all those shows. So I want to go back through that process once again. For new listeners, what all goes into building a season-long projection for you? Yeah, so, you know, I go with more of a top-down approach. You know, I, I know that a lot of people probably think that it's just sort of like looking at different uh, uh, po offensive positional players and looking at wide receivers and running backs, just sort of like throwing target numbers at them and then kind of looking at a yards per target rate and doing it. 
My, mine's a lot more processed than that. Um, you know, I, I look at it from a top-down approach. Like I said, I look at the team level first, and then I dig into the individual players. So what do I mean by looking at the team level? I'm talking about pass rates. I'm looking at plays run per game, and I'm able to then project pass and rush attempts based on some of those things. To get those numbers, you know, I'm looking at team win totals as, as one input to see what game script might generally look like. Cause obviously if teams are trailing more then that means they're not going to be, or they're going to be a little bit more pass heavy and vice versa. Uh, you know, obviously there's team uh, philosophy driven things. You know, if a, a coach likes to do a certain thing or run a certain offense, then they might be a little bit more run heavy or pass heavy. But at the end of the day, you know, a good, a good example of this is like Seattle this year where they're just not going to be that good. Um, and so, you know, you can look at them philosophically. Yeah. Pete Carroll would love to run the ball 50 times a game, but it's just not going to happen in that offense because they're not going to be, you know, ahead uh, and they're going to be trailing a lot uh, this season. So, you know, from there, then once you get some of those high level team numbers uh, where you have pass attempts, you have rush attempts, um, you know, I can then look at the quarterback numbers and I can start to project quarterback play and that all feeds back up into the team level stuff. And so instead of looking at it from the perspective of I'm projecting quarterback attempts, I'm projecting team attempts. And then I'm projecting the percentage of dropbacks or attempts that a particular quarterback on a team would get. So, you know, most guys I'm going to project for like 98% of the team's attempts. Uh, but there's some situations like Pittsburgh, for instance, or, uh, you know, Cleveland throughout the offseason, because we don't know what's going on with Deshaun Watson, where, you know, it's more of like a 50-50 thing or a 70-30 thing or what have you. So uh, I'm able pro to project quarterback numbers. And then from there, once the quarterback numbers are projected and I have passing output in terms of yardage and stuff and stuff like that, I can then start to divide uh, receiving numbers. Um, and so I'm looking at more target share stuff rather than targets themselves because target share, again, feeds back up into the team level stuff. And then for running backs, it's rush share. And then, you know, from, from the standpoint of like efficiency and how they uh, score touchdowns and uh, how they generate yards, all that stuff is really regression analysis. It's looking at how these players did previously and historically uh, combined with, you know, some, some guys are rookies or some guys, you know, you only have one year on them or something like that. I'm really just looking at historical averages. Um, and, you know, if, if some, some of it is subjective, you know, I'm bumping up if this guy is a good player or not, then he's probably going to be a little bit better than the historical average. So there is some subjectivity involved there, but I try to keep it as process oriented as possible. And then from a touchdown standpoint, when I'm projecting touchdowns, a lot of that is regression analysis based on just some formulas. Like uh, I, I have a pass, you know, a receiving yardage, to touchdown type formula that I, that I w work with. And then I look at like average depth of target. And I look at where these guys could be seeing looks on the field. Cause obviously if they're seeing more red zone looks than not, then they could see more, more uh, scores uh, overall. So there's a lot of things that go into it, but I think the overall important thing to take away is that I'm looking at the team level first. I'm understanding the team, what they want to do, what their philosophy is, what the game scripts might look like. And then that's all feeding into the player stuff. So let's dig into that team level stuff here because that's a huge thing, like you mentioned. And this is also an inflection point for that because a lot of teams have had philosophical changes, whether it be because of coaching changes or quarterback changes, stuff like that. They're going to be different in 2022 than they were in 2021. So when you are building your projections, entering run pass ratio, stuff like that, are there any teams you think could surprise us for this year that could lead to a player being or players on that team on the whole being either over or undervalued? Yeah, I, I think there's two teams. They're actually from the same division that really uh, are, are interesting from this perspective. Because I think there's like some teams like Minnesota, for instance, where people just generally know that they're going to be a little bit more pass heavy. It's going to be a little bit different than what we've seen with Mike Zimmer. But there's one team that there's just natural regression that's likely to hit, and that's Baltimore. Um, you know, I, I don't think people fully realize what happened in Baltimore last year offensively from like a pass rate standpoint and a passing volume standpoint. You know, last year they had a lot of more negative game scripts than what we've seen with Greg Roman as offensive coordinator and Lamar Jackson at quarterback. Obviously, Lamar was hurt for some of the season as well, but they had bad injuries in their secondary and on defense, and that led to a lot of negative game scripts. They ended up running by far the most plays in football, like by far more than what we've seen, you know, three or four plays per game more than what we'd seen during this Greg Roman, Lamar Jackson era. And so on top of that, they were also a little bit more pass heavy in terms of pass rate than what we've seen with Lamar Jackson and Greg Roman. You know, the two years prior to last year with those two guys, they were 32nd in the league in pass rate. They were they were the run-heaviest team in football. Last year, they were 23rd. So they were a little bit more pass-heavy, but because they ran so many plays, 
They were ninth in the NFL in pass attempts last year, Baltimore. Which, is, which is wild <laughs> to think about in this Lamar Jackson era and this offense. They had the ninth most pass attempts in the NFL. And it's crazy because like everyone's talking about Marquise Brown and in, in fantasy because he's an early earlyish round pick, etc. He's going from a team that actually threw more pass attempts last year to one who threw fewer <laughs> when he goes from from Baltimore to Arizona. And so, you know, we shouldn't expect this to continue for Baltimore year over year. You know, it's a team that's naturally going to regress from a plays run standpoint. I think they, they'll they probably run four or so fewer plays per game this year. Uh, you know, they have J.K. Dobbins, who's looking at least a little bit healthier. He's definitely healthier than he was last year. Um, and so they might just lean on the run game a little bit more naturally. They don't have Hollywood Brown anymore, so that's another reason why. And the defense is healthier. So they could see better game scripts overall. They have their running backs more intact. It just makes sense that we would see them regress a little bit back towards what we saw the first two years when Lamar Jackson was the full-time starter. So that's one team. And then another team within that same division who I think is going to dramatically change from a, from an offensive philosophy standpoint is Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, the last two seasons has been the second most pass heavy team in the NFL. Only Tampa Bay has been more pass heavy and it's because they've been running this offense with this horrible offensive line, the statue and Ben Roethlisberger under center uh, and he's just trying to get the ball out quick. He's been first in time to throw over the last couple of years. He's not been sacked that that often. And now you get the quarterback change. And, and really the quarterback change, they're going to go to a quarter, even if the quarterback isn't good or effective, they're, they're moving to a quarterback that fits the Matt Canada scheme a lot better, who can roll out, who's more mobile. Look what they did this offseason. They, they signed Mitch Trubisky, who's a mobile quarterback. They draft Kenny Pickett, who's a mobile quarterback. He's not, you know, they're, they're, neither of them are Trey Lance, but they're both guys who can escape the pocket and create with their legs. Um, and so I, I think we're going to see the Steelers then as a result of that, you know, have just a, a different philosophy in general. They're not going to want to lean on their quarterbacks either as much probably as they did with Ben Roethlisberger. And so I think the offense is just going to look a lot different. Hopefully the offensive line is a little bit better because they did make at least some moves, but still probably going to be one of the worst in the league. Um, but, you know, overall, I, I think we're going to see the Steelers lean more on Najee Harris. And this is one of those teams too. You know, Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season in the NFL. It's one of those teams where, you know, from a game script perspective, the defense is good enough. We could probably expect them to at least be in games. And so it's not a situation like Seattle where they want to run the football and they just can't. I think the Steelers could hypothetically, you know, just be a lower score, you know, have, be in some lower scoring games uh, and really force the run a little bit because the defense is actually decent. And it's important to keep those philosophical changes in mind, not just for the season long player props, but also once we get to week one, keep that in mind with yeah. Baltimore Pittsburgh too, because that'll be applicable to, you know, Rashad Bateman yardage props and stuff like that. So keep yeah. that in mind uh, for weekly props as well. Well, we've had you on the show in the past, JJ, you have absolutely nailed the yardage leader categories over on FanDuel. You had Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb, uh, whatever year that the first year was, and they were one, two in the league and rushing for that year. So Finding guys who will blow up seems to be a strength for you. For this year, FanDuel has odds up not just yardage leaders, but also touchdown leaders. So where are you finding value across those markets at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, so I, I have three. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, with what I just talked about with Pittsburgh, um, we could see, you know, more rushing yards for that team in general. Um, you know, the Steelers aren't a great team, uh, but like I said, Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season. I think they're philosophically, they're going to want to run the football. Najee Harris right now is plus 1800 to lead the NFL uh, in rushing. You know, he was that that's ninth on FanDuel Sportsbook at the position. Uh, right now, he's fourth in my projections, uh, you know, in terms of rushing yards, uh, total rushing yards. Um, you know, volume is really the thing that's going to drive something like this. It's not really efficiency that's going to drive it. I mean, obviously, you know, you want efficiency and you likely will need a decent yards per carry rate to lead the NFL in rushing. Um, but really, you know, if, if one of the top guys misses a game like a Jonathan Taylor or, or Derrick Henry or someone like that, then all of a sudden it's not crazy to think that that Najee Harris would be able to do it. Um, and then the other thing with Najee is that the Steelers don't have a backup running back. I mean, they do, but not a good one. Right. I mean, it's, it's Benny Snell right now. I still think the Steelers are in play to maybe take advantage of a, of a team's running back depth chart right now when they cut uh, some of these running backs to, to sign one of those running backs. And that guy might be their number two. Um, but regardless, you know, right now, as it stands, the Steelers are entering the season uh, with Benny Snell as their, their RB2. And, you know, you have Anthony McFarlane there, too, and such. But no one who is scaring you. So I think, you know, they can say what they want about Najee Harris not seeing the same exact workload that he did last year. I do think that they might limit his snaps a little bit. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I could see them maybe limiting his receiving snaps more than I could see them limiting his rushing snaps. So I'm going to I'm going to lean into Najee Harris there at plus 1800. Uh, to lead the league in rushing. Um, I also 
from a receiving perspective, uh, I think that DJ Moore at plus 3,000 is an unbelievable value right now. Uh, that's tied for 13th on FanDuel Sportsbook. My projections right now have him at 7th uh, in, in receiving. Uh, you know, I think Moore's really interesting because he's just been really efficient throughout his, his career from a yards per target standpoint. Last year was his lowest season in yards per target at 7.1, but he was at 10.1 the year before that. His career yards per target is 8.7. That's way above the league average because he's a really good wide receiver. You know, that number generally does regress year over year a little bit, but if you're looking at last season and that 7.1 number, it wouldn't shock me if from a projection standpoint and from a, a market standpoint, you know, they're weighing that a little bit more than what they would weigh what he did previously. Potential quarterback upgrade, probable quarterback upgrade in Baker Mayfield, negative game scripts in Carolina because they're not going to be a very good team. Um, you know, and since his rookie season, DJ Moore has seen target shares of 22.4%, 23.4%, and last year, 28.2%. So if he's able to continue and maintain that kind of target share, I don't think it'll be as high this season because CMC will be healthy. But regardless, even if he can get to a 27% target share, if he's efficient enough, he at least has a chance in this uh, in this offense and on this team where they should see some negative game scripts um, you know, to, to, to really put up great receiving numbers. So that's my pick for receiving yards. And then I got one more for you. I like Russell Wilson at plus 1600 to lead the NFL in passing. Touchdowns. That Russ cook. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing with quarterbacks from a projection standpoint, you want quarterbacks. If they're going to, if they're going to throw a lot of touchdowns, they need to have some sort of crazy touchdown rate. And with crazy touchdown rates, you want them closing or you want them throwing close to the end zone. Um, you want them throwing at the goal line and in the red zone. This should be a more pass heavy scheme for him. Uh, the Broncos now have Nathaniel Hackett uh, as, as head coach, who is the offensive coordinator for the Packers from 2019 to 2021. Now, I understand they had Aaron Rodgers, so take this all with a grain of salt, but Russell Wilson's still a very, very good quarterback. I mean, it's not like Russell Wilson's this like insane, you know, it's not like he's going from uh, Aaron Rodgers to Geno Smith here. He's going from Aaron Rodgers to Russell Wilson. Green Bay is tied for the most pass attempts within the five yard line while Nathaniel Hackett was offensive coordinator there. That's at the goal line. So that's over the last three years, they've thrown the ball at the goal line more than any other team, or at least tied for. And not only that, but they're second, they were second in pass rate. The only team that was higher at the goal line in pass rate has been Jacksonville over the last three years, um, which is crazy because Green Bay has been a good team, which means that, you know, they haven't really been trailing uh, and they're throwing at the goal line uh, because this is just what they want to do. And, you know, some of that, again, some of this might just be an Aaron Rodgers thing, but look at what Russell Wilson has done historically. He's had insane touchdown rates year after year after year because he too is aggressive closer to the end zone. So I think that, you know, this offense is awesome. I'm really excited to see them, but I think Russell Wilson at plus 1600 right now is a really good bet to throw the most touchdowns. And they've got some great red zone bodies too, between Albert yeah. Okwebenam, um, Cortland Sutton, typically pretty good down there as well. So that's, that's exciting. I'm curious though, does the terrible corny let's ride tagline is that a boost up in your projections for us? Or because I feel like that's like at least a 5% decrease of our building line. Yeah, look, I mean, like the, the, the cornball factor is always there for, for Russ in my projections. I guess so that's yeah, baked I mean, in. No, you're it's right. It's all factored it's baked in. in. No. Yeah, it's Okay, factored. that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Okay, so you mentioned the touchdown numbers, Russell Wilson. I want to talk about individual player props as well, starting with rushing, because I think that you were talking about regression. And the regression piece is the biggest in the touchdown market. So I'm curious if you found any individual touchdown props you liked, or if we're sticking with yardage here, because the, the touchdown one intrigued me. I don't know a lot about it. That's why I'm asking you, but uh, any individual player props standing up for you over at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, look, you know, if you look at Rashad Penny right now, um, he has an over under of 799 and a half rushing yards. Uh, if you look at his situation, he has one of the worst offensive lines in football. He has the worst quarterback situation in football and his team has one of the worst team totals in football. So I'm going to take the under with Rashad Penny getting to about 800 rushing yards. The other thing with Rashad Penny is he's not an every down back. He wasn't utilized that way at all last year. You know, even when he was dominating in fantasy football and dominating uh, even, you know, on the ground in real football, he had eight targets last year. Rashad Penny did. That was one of the, the lowest rush attempts to or one of the highest rush attempts to target rates that we've seen from a hundred plus attempt running back over the last decade. Um, and so that's bad because if there's a negative game script for this offense, then Rashad Penny's not going to be on the field. Um, and so, you know, you do want three down backs, you know, even for, you know, for, for props like this, because uh, you know, even when teams are trailing, they still run the ball. Sometimes they're not just only throwing the football. 
And so if that's the case, he can, he can obviously gobble up more rushing yards and such. But I'm just worried about how game scripts are going to go for this really not good Seattle team. And then on top of that, they went out and they drafted Kenneth Walker. And Kenneth Walker is a great runner. I mean, you know, you can question how he, uh, how he looked as a prospect from a receiving perspective, but it's really tough to question what he is as a runner. Um, and so he's sort of a redundant piece to Rashad Penny, where we could see a scenario where Penny's phased out, Penny's not used nearly as much, you know, down the stretch, and he hasn't been able to stay healthy either throughout his career. So there's just a lot going against Rashad Penny. Don't think he's going to maintain his 6.3 yards per carry rate year over year. Um, I just think there's a lot of reasons to take the under here. And when I'm looking for an under, I'm looking for paths to an under. I want to find different routes to having that under hit. You mentioned uh, the fact that he could get, I mean, he's any running back can get hurt. So that's always in play. The Kenneth Walker factor, whether it be he outplays him or they're, you know, they're a two win team late in the year and want to go look at Kenneth Walker with Rashad Penny being in a contract year, you know, they may want to do that as well. There's a lot of routes, routes to an under here. I think that makes a lot of sense with regards to Rashad Penny. Uh, what about receiving props? Where are you finding value over there? Yeah, I have one. I usually don't like taking overs that much with player props, but there's one that I think is pretty glaring, and it's T. Higgins. His his over under right now is at a thousand yards, thousand and a half yards. You know, like I said, I hate going with overs, but the Bengals, um, and not only that, but the Bengals have some some passing regression coming this year. Burrow led the league last year in yards per attempt, and it was one of the best yards per attempt rates of all time. Uh, you know, understandably, they have some of the best weapons in football. They have a much improved offensive line. That's another reason to just sort of think that the regression, you know, it might happen, but it might not be as severe as what we would otherwise see. Um, but Higgins right now for me, and again, I project generally healthy seasons for these guys. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but he's projected for 1150 yards in my projections right now. So even accounting for a small injury, he could hypothetically miss two games and still get to that 1000 yard mark. Maybe he could even miss three games if he's very efficient or if we see like an, a Jamar Chase injury or something and then more targets are funneled uh, T Higgins way. But, you know, last season, Higgins actually averaged a higher target share per game than Jamar Chase did. Um, you know, he just missed time and Jamar Chase didn't miss that the, the same amount of time. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that Chase is going to naturally see a little bit more love this year as a second year guy as opposed to a first year guy. And, you know, he's not a rookie anymore, more experience, all that. But T. Higgins is probably a lock to see at least a 22% target share in that offense. And it's an offense that should be explosive, that should be good. I think getting to 1,000 yards should be pretty easy for such a talented guy. I think the important thing with them, too, is they were very conservative last year. I think in large part to conserve Joe Burrow coming yeah. out that ACL. And you talked about potentially Baltimore and Pittsburgh being more run heavy. I think Cincinnati could be more pass heavy, despite the fact they are a good team. Just because they were so conservative at times last year, that benefit T. Higgins, that benefit uh, Hayden Hurst, like everybody associated with this team could get a boost up uh, because of that. That is JJ Zacharyson. You can find him on Twitter at Late Round. You can beat QB. You can find him at the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast and LateRound.com. JJ, before we let you go, where can people find your season long draft guide if they want to get some help with their upcoming season long drafts? Yeah, it's all over on LateRound.com. You know, I, I I did this draft guide to not necessarily just throw a bunch of player profiles at you, which is fine. You know, that's, that's de there's definitely a place no for shots, that. Yeah. But I'd say like 90, you know, 85% of this guide is more game theory focused and strategy focused. So you're going to understand a little bit better how to attack your draft and not just picking the right players. So I do have players to target, players to avoid, and my tiers and all that kind of stuff in there. But a lot of it is more game theory stuff. So hopefully people dig it. I think people have so far. It's all over on LateRound.com. All righty. I'm excited to have you back on the show as well to talk about in-season player props, too. That is going to be a blast. Uh, have a fantastic weekend, JJ, and thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, again, check out JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB. You'll hear him again in season. It's going to be a fun time. That is all we got here for today on Covering the Spread. Thank you all for joining us for this first week of daily shows. We'll be back with you on Monday to talk about some Major League Baseball. Make sure you're subscribed on uh, the to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. And I'm on Twitter at Jim Saunas as well. Have a fantastic week we weekend. We'll talk to you all next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Thank you